So we're looking forward to the midterms in part when we talk about security. And there's a lot of concern about what the Russians and now maybe the Chinese might do. This is what President Trump had to say about possible Chinese interference with the upcoming midterms. Earlier today and, and just now, you made a, a significant allegation against the Chinese government. You suggested that the Chinese had meddled in or are meddling That's right. in That's what I hear. midterm election. That's what I hear. What evidence do you have of that, sir? Is there a national we have intelligence evidence. estimate? We have evidence. It'll come out. Forward? Yeah, I can't tell you now, but it, it came. It didn't come out of nowhere that I can tell you. Now, Why if you, they've actually out? admitted that they're going after farmers. So, Richard, you heard him. He has evidence about the Chinese. We've heard about the Russians already. Everybody seems to be absolutely certain the Russians last time tried to interfere. We've heard Dan Coates say there are red lights flashing this time. What, what is your assessment about the security of our electoral process from outside inter, in, uh, interference from uh, state actors? Well, I think it's very poor. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about election security, there are actually four different problems. Uh, quickly, there's social media where the Russians pretend to be African-Americans or they pretend to be Green Party supporters. Uh, the second uh, is the registration process, the voter registration itself. Uh, the third is the campaigns, who are pop-up organizations. They're only around for three or four months. And then finally, there's the vote count mechanism. Uh, all of those things uh, are susceptible to attack in one way or another. Uh, none of them have been fixed. Uh, since we had our significant attack on the United States in two, 2016. Some steps have been taken, but we're not ready. We know that the Russian bots, the Russian trolls that were active in 2016, are still active. Uh, they've changed their names, uh, but their identities are the same, uh, and they're being very active, and they will turn up that activity in the next month leading up to the election. So we have it specifically with respect to elections. We have a broader set of issues about cybersecurity overall. Why haven't we had really centralization in the federal government and authority given to somebody to address this? Uh, would that help the problem? Well, I think somebody has to be in charge. Uh, and there's some hope there, David. The House has passed a bill uh, consolidating activities in the Department of Homeland Security and creating a new cybersecurity agency. You know, there are seven big agencies right now that make up the Homeland Security Department. This would be number eight. It would be a cybersecurity agency. So giving them the authority, giving them the, the role is one thing. Giving them the money and the skill is something else. Uh, and that won't be done simply by creating a new agency. So uh, give us a sense of how you think uh, President Trump is doing on the subject overall of national security. We just heard him before the United Nations General Assembly, and he spent a fair amount of time talking about Iran and the sponsorship of terrorism around the Mideast region and how we have to really go after that. Is he and his team doing an effective job at really making us more secure? Well, you know, David, I took uh, a president of the United States to the U.N. I was in charge of putting the the trip together and, and the, the theme together for seven years in a row uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, and usually, uh, we, several months out, came up with a positive theme, a subject that we wanted to, to drive home. I didn't see that this year. I didn't see it last year. What the theme seemed to be both years was that America is stepping back from being the leader of the world. Uh, it's stepping back from its leadership at the UN. Uh, the, the subtext is not uh, America is the leader. It's America wants to be alone. America wants to be isolated and occasionally lash out rhetorically at people. But you can't say simultaneously that you want other people to carry their share of the burden, other nations to do things as well, and then destroy the organizations like NATO, um, like NAFTA, like the UN, where the United States set those organizations up so that other nations could contribute to the international stability and security system. The Trump administration seems to be uh, systematically taking apart the burden-sharing uh, alliances uh, that the United States built and nurtured over 50 years. 
So, Richard, uh, talk about something that you spend an awful lot of time and effort on, and that is specifically Islamic uh, extremist terrorism, first with al-Qaeda, then with Islamic State. Uh, the President Trump has basically said, we've beaten Islamic State at this point. Is he right, or has it morphed into other places? Well, he's right, certainly, that the alliance against uh, ISIS uh, pushed them out of the cities that they had taken uh, in three countries, Libya, uh, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, the cities are in ruin. Uh, there are millions of refugees. There's not a serious coordinated program to rebuild the cities or help the refugees. And so those cities will just become petri dishes for a second round of terrorism. Uh, he's wrong if he says that ISIS has gone away, or even al-Qaeda uh, has gone away. Uh, they're still alive. They have thousands of armed, heavily armed adherents. Uh, there is a new theater uh, of operation, uh, and that's in the Sahel uh, and in uh, West Africa, uh, where they're very much alive. But, David, they're still alive uh, in parts of Syria, parts of Iraq, and parts of Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the war in Afghanistan is now entering its 18th year. We still have 15,000 troops there. Uh, and the reason we do is we haven't won. We haven't won, but we haven't also had a major attack since then. Have we, if we haven't beaten them entirely, have we really largely neutralized them so that the attacks are much more local? I think we've made it very difficult uh, for a major 9-11 style attack to occur here in the United States. Very difficult, not impossible. Uh, and we should never be shocked if something happens. I think it's still possible, for example, uh, that someday they'll figure out how to get a bomb on an airplane, and they may blow up a bomb in an airplane as it approaches an American city. Uh, but what we're left with uh, in the United States, and mostly in Western Europe, is the threat of lone wolf attacks, where the, the cell is one person, or one person and their brother or their wife. Uh, those can be very devastating, uh, but we don't have the threat of major attacks on the United States anywhere near the level that we had uh, in 2000. So, Richard, finally, let me ask you the question that I would ask you back when we worked together at ABC News. The, you're the person I'd talk, turn to to say, okay, look at the whole world, wrap up together everything we just talked, cybersecurity, Islamic State, everything. If you were going to say what the number one threat to the United States is right now, what would you say it is? I'd say in the near term, uh, David, it's what's going on in Israel uh, and Syria. Right now, we have Israel, Syria, the United States, Russia, and Iran all butting heads uh, in the airspace and on the ground uh, in Syria and on the Israeli border. I've never seen tensions that high in that region. The threats are high. The militaries are on high alert. The potential for accident uh, and escalation is very, very high. And what we need right now desperately uh, between Russia, the United States, Syria, Iran, uh, is for some diplomacy to de-escalate that situation.